Good morning and welcome to the Catholic Foundation Enhanced Leadership Series. I'm Dan Odom and it's my pleasure to be chair of the Catholic Foundation Board of Trustees. We're pleased that you're here today. We're delighted to have Tom Rogerson as our guest speaker. Many of you know about the Catholic Foundation because of the nearly $20 million in grants that we make on an annual basis to charitable, religious, and educational organizations throughout North Texas and beyond. Those grants go to both Catholic organizations, non-Catholic organizations, as I said, locally and abroad. At the core, the foundation provides expertise to ensure that whatever assets that our donors entrust to us are maximized to, to ensure that they are able to achieve their charitable intentions. Simply put, we promote compassionate charitable giving and help our donors achieve their charitable legacies by creating customized giving plans. The foundation's lay led meaning we're independent of the Diocese of Dallas. And we currently manage more than $250 million in assets in over 540 charitable funds and trust. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Kramer, President and CEO of the Catholic Foundation, who will offer our blessing. Matt. Thank you, Dan, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. We're excited that Tom is with us to Enlighten us all, so let's, uh, let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you're the, you're the source of all the greatest gifts that we have in this world. Thank you for bringing these people together that take your gifts and return them out into your kingdom to grow your kingdom. Bless our conversation today, bless our discussions, help and enlighten us. And we ask for these things in your name. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Next, we'd like to invite up Dorena Pating, who's Vice President of Development. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. I guess we're technically still in the morning time. My name is Dorena O'Dowd Pating. I'm the Vice President of the Catholic Foundation. It's my honor and ple pleasure to welcome you today, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are thrilled to introduce our very good friend and featured speaker, Tom Rogerson. Tom is a recognized leader and pioneer in family governance and legacy planning. His meeting with Jay Hughes over 30 years ago inspired him to transform his practice from preparing the money for the family to preparing the family for the money. In 2017, Tom teamed up with his wife, Kathy, a cert certified relationship coach, and started Genleg Company, Incorporated. Today, they provide guidance and education to families and their advisors helping them transition significant capital, both financial and human, from one generation to the next. Prior to starting a family, a private family legacy consulting practice, Tom was with the Wilmington Trust, bringing his family governance and legacy planning expertise as both a speaker and a motivator, not to only families, but to Wilmington's client-facing teams. Tom has spoken for the, w, for the World President's Organization, Harvard University Business School, Tiger 21, the Lincoln Center, Yale University, as well as numerous estate planning councils, community foundations, and other organizations. Tom is joining us today from Duxbury, Massachusetts. We're thrilled to welcome you back to Dallas, Texas. I think it's home from home from, from what I've seen and heard. Uh, well, we're thrilled to have you back. We do have a couple of fun facts to share about Tom. The first is his birthday is February the 16th, which was just a couple of months ago. And for those of you sitting at the table who have a birthday closest to Tom's birthday, you are very welcome to take those beautiful centerpieces home with you. So I will leave that up to you to, to discuss nicely with each other, but February 16th is the date, so you're very welcome and uh, enjoy those when you leave today. The other fun fact about Tom is uh, a man of many talents, but he has performed close-up magic in various locations, one being at the Magic Castle in California. 
Los Angeles, California. So on that note, with a bit of mag magic, I'd like to welcome Tom Rogerson to the stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> Unless you're going to magically appear. No, thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. I'm a huge fan of faith-based organizations and, um, and, and really helping to get the message out of how you can transfer not just wealth to next generations, but values as well. So I've got a lot of material that I'm hoping to cover, and um, I'm going to jump right in. The, um, the, the underlying problem, or, or I should just quickly introduce my background as estate tax planning. And uh, I, I was at Coopers and Lyburn and was really helping families protect and preserve the money for the next generation. But about 40 years ago, that's when I met Jay Hughes, and he introduced me to this whole notion of, but what are, are you preparing the money for? Are you preparing the family for the money down the road? And um, it just totally transformed what I was doing. And I eventually transformed what I was doing from estate planning to really family governance work. And so I've been doing that for now 35 years. And uh, my wife was doing relationship coaching, and that's why we just thought banding together, we could focus just on being a consulting firm to families, and then we could work with any other wealth management firm or any other charitable organization. There wasn't a conflict of interest. So that's how we got to where we are. Um, I'm going to break this up in a few different sections, though, to give you a sense of, of uh, what this all looks like. The why is, why is this important? And just a, a little a couple of surveys that really affected me in this regard. There was a survey done of wealth advisors, or of wealthy inv investors, um, a number of years ago, just about three years ago. And 61% of these wealthy clients, when were asked, uh, said that legacy development was not it was a top unmet need. In other words, they really thought it was important, but they weren't hearing this from their advisors. And legacy is not necessarily, I want to have my name on a building or something like that. Legacy is this whole idea of what are your long-term hopes and goals for your family, and is your estate plan designed to actually enable that or even encourage that? Most of the estate plans are not. Most estate plans are really designed to minimize the taxes. That's not necessarily focusing on a long-term vision for your family that the family's engaged in buying into and really in based on family values. So this was a huge unmet need. 86% uh, of the clients that were uh, surveyed said that it was important to leave values and life lessons as part of their inheritance, if not the majority of their inheritance. And yet again, they were saying their advisors were not focusing on that. They would sit down and focus on the law, the taxes, and the minimization. David York, an estate planner out in Utah, he's uh, well known and does really high level estate planning. And he found that the people coming into his office typically had estate plans from other places. But 90% of them said the estate plans they were walking in with were not accomplishing their goals, wants, and objectives. Because believe it or not, their goals, wants, and objectives were not to get 10% more money to their children. Their goals, wants, and objectives were very different to have their children actually appreciate whatever was left and what would that look like. There was a study done at the uh, Heckerling as an estate planning conference for estate planners, and it's the largest in the country, actually the largest in the world. 5,000 attorneys show up to learn about estate planning techniques. And um, the last one that they held in person before COVID, um, they did a survey of the advisors asking, what's the biggest impediment to your clients achieving their estate planning goals and accomplishing in their plans what they wanted? And they said family conflict. By far, 46%. Uh, that was the biggest number by far of all the issues that might come up. And, uh, and so what we're going to talk about, well, then how do you deal with that? And, uh, and what would it look like? And George Burns had a great quote for this. He said, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. <laughs> and there's painful truth to that. Does it really have to be that way? I mean, can't we all just get along? The underlying problem originally was focused on from a money standpoint. They were looking at the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve phenomenon, that first generations build the wealth, second generations get used to it, third generations enjoy the heck out of it, fourth generations lament the fact that it's now gone. Um, that's where my family is, right about where that red dot is. My great-grandfather was a very wealthy man. He started um, a, a wealth management organization and trust company in Boston called the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company. Grew it to be the largest financial institution in Boston by almost any measure. And, um, and he started a foundation in Boston that right now has a little bit more than a billion dollars in it. So even by Texas standards, he was doing OK. Um, <laughs> not, not great, but OK. You know? uh, his estate plan was designed to get the bulk of the money down to the family. I'm his great-grandson. 
and in the family, the money's gone. He may have set up a big foundation, but the money in the family's gone. And it's not gone because we're stupid. We were a wonderful, loving, wonderful, normal family. And it turned out so many things we were doing intentionally, lovingly for next generations were not having the desired effect we would have liked. And so what do you do differently? And what we're finding is 60% of families of wealth, this comes from our own study my wife and I have done, along with studies done by uh, Williams and Pressure over decades, but 60% of families lose unity, connection, and history, and their wealth, by the end of a second generation. 80% of families lose unity, connection, and, uh, by the end of the, the third generation. And the wealth typically follows that. It's not that they lose their money that causes them to lose their family. They lose their family, and that causes them to lose their money in their businesses. And so the three forms of, of what they're losing is they're losing their, primarily, their identity, their history is forgotten. When a grandparent dies, a library burns down. And most families don't archive this information. And the second thing they were losing is a sense of... Uh, of knowing each other. They were raised to be independent, in many cases, to the point of estrangement from each other. And I'm gonna come back to that more in a minute because I really wanna build on that. What does it look like? Why do wealthy families build more independence, nothing wrong with independence, until it get, you go too far? And when you go too far, they don't know each other. And the third thing that they were losing was the financial wealth. And as I said, that was following the others. But what was really interesting in the studies that were done, they asked the families that said they failed. These are families that admitted we failed. We lost these things. We lost the sense of identity and con connection, and we lost our wealth. And what they found was in, when they asked the, the families, well, how did you lose it? 60% of the failure they said was due to lack of experience and trust around group decision making. That's important. And I'm going to come back to that many times in this presentation because that's really critical. They, they don't have experience, and, they don't have, and then they don't build trust at making group decisions together. 25% of the fail was due to unprepared heirs. People received money, they didn't have the vocabulary of what to do with it. 10% of the failure, they said, was due to not feeling like I personally have a place in this family. This family, I feel almost estranged. I don't have a place of purpose to accomplish my life goal in this family. Well, that's 95% of the problem. This is not the majority or the, the minority, the problem. Less than 5% of the failure of this was due to mistakes made in the planning and investing area. So maybe they're doing a great job on planning and investing, but they're not somehow connecting the family to that plan down the road. Well, if 60% of the failure is due to lack of experience and trust around group decision making, how do you build trust? There are three pillars of building trust. One is, can you prove you're reliable? Can you prove you're sincere? And can you prove you're competent? Now, competency is the one that some people think, well, what about people that, may, I don't know, have a disability or something? I mean, you know, what, are we going to claim that they're incompetent and maybe diss them or not build trust in them? Competency is not about their ability. It's usually more about did we take the time to train them? Many people could be competent at doing lots of things in a family, but they're often not trained to do it. And so uh, they often don't end up with it. Well, to build reliability, to show it, and sincerity and competency, you need to do things together. You need to make decisions together. Remember, the number one reason the families are failing due to lack of experience and trust around group decision making. And you're gonna see that families of wealth make fewer decisions together than lower net worth families. Without these three, trust is just not built. These first three, the 60%, the 25, and the 10, are cultural issues within the family. How does the, the family operate as a culture? And you, know, you think of toxic cultures, you think of happy cultures, you think of productive cultures, you think of all kinds of cultures, but what's the culture of our family if we were to define it? How would our family de define our culture? And Peter Drucker, he was a business consultant, but he said something profound about the culture of a business. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. That all the CEOs and management teams want to focus on what's our strategy, what are our metrics, what's our profitability? And he said, the culture of the company is more important than all that. You want people to want to work for you. They're going to be able to really engage the clientele down the road. Well, the same is true in families. The culture of a family is really important, the intentional portion of a family. Well, if families are failing, you know, if the financial wealth, if it's creating this more separation and independence, if the family doesn't last and the wealth doesn't last, what's the legacy? 
And so that's the why of what we're doing. Uh, one more little bit of it, I want to kind of document why it is that wealthier families tend to grow more apart than lower net worth families. And I'm going to use a little uh, scale here. Imagine wealth going up as we go off to the right, level of wealth in a family going off to the right. And you don't have to have huge wealth. Now, many of these things take hold, by the way. My family has many branches that don't have huge wealth at all, I mean, in certainly including mine. Um, but we're doing a lot of the things I'm going to be showing you today, and they're having a very positive effect on our family. <laughs> Um, on the left-hand scale, we're going to talk about the level of human dependence with kind of a reverse order, with dependent people being at the top, then independent in the middle, and interdependent people at the bottom, which is really a higher state. And there's this kind of fat tail bell curve that goes off to the right, where low net worth families have tremendous interdependence. They're making decisions together every day by necessity. And just to paint the picture of what that looks like a little bit, uh, a lower net worth family typically has um, dinner table conversations that are consequential, uh, like who gets the car on Friday night. They debate it. Why? Because there's one car. Or, you know, who gets the bathroom in the morning? They talk about that in the morning because, you know, who gets, there might be one bathroom to be shared upstairs. Lower net worth families make these kinds of decisions every day. Many times those children have summer jobs and live at home in the summertime. Again, spending more time with their siblings, making decisions together, doing chores. Uh, many times these children, um, uh, one interesting thing about this was they found that 14-year-old children in a family like this often knew how to buy a car. Why would a 14-year-old child in a lower net worth family know how to buy a car? Because they probably saw the whole thing happen right in front of them. They might have been strapped in the back seat for the test drive. They heard the parents talking about at the dinner table, can we afford leasing or buying or whatever? And 75% of the wealthiest people in this country today grew up in the background I'm talking about. Even on the Forbes 400 list of the wealthiest people in this country, 72% of them grew up in the background I'm talking about. Uh, it's not like uber wealthy just breed uber wealthy. It's middle class, lower, working class, uh, blue collar backgrounds that actually grow. This is an entrepreneurial incubator. Well, if somebody in that family has chutzpah and ability, they want to get away from that hardship of making all these decisions together every day, and they want to raise their children in independence, the, the American dream. And so children in that middle dot typically paint the picture again. Dinner table conversations here are less consequential. They're more social. How's your golf game? How's your tennis game? You know, they, they're very nice, but they're less consequential usually. And, um, and so these children at age... 14 rarely know how to buy a car. Now, why would a 14-year-old in a wealthy family rarely know how to buy a car? Because if the parents are buying a $200,000 fancy car, they're less likely to talk about that in front of their children at the dinner table, no matter how much money they have. And so the children were not only not participating in the decision, they weren't even seeing how the parents were making decisions behind closed doors. And that, yet these are the very children that are going to learn how, going to need to ha be able to make decisions together when the parents are gone, because there might be a business, there might be real estate, there might be a foundation, there might be all kinds of things that they would need to work on together to manage, but they don't have the experience that the lower net worth family has it working together. Is that making some sense? It's not universal, but the percentages are in the favor of what I'm talking about. And so it's causing this separation of families. That, um, and wealthy families are more likely to actually be separate. Those children that I was describing, the wealthier family, they might not go to private school, but they might. They might go to a different one than their siblings went to. They might, um, and if they're at a private school that's boarding, they might not even be at home on the weekends to share time with their siblings. They might go to summer camp, not have a summer job and stay at home. All these things create wonderful opportunities for them individually but they actually know the family less. Remember, the number one reason that families were failing, 60% of the failure was due to lack of trust and experience around group decision making. The people in the middle dot were making fewer decisions of consequence on a daily basis. And that's really what we're, probably the, the biggest thing we're trying to reintroduce. And it's where family philanthropy, based on your values and how you operate with, with your family and your children and your grandchildren, in the use of a donor-advised fund for giving to charity, it's a beginning place where many families start learning how to make decisions together. Because ultimately, if they practice decision at that level, they know how to make decisions for things later on within the family. Well, that lower left-hand quadrant is an entrepreneurial incubator. Most entrepreneurs in the country identify with that as their background. The middle zone where they raise their children is an entrepreneurial kill zone. 
High net worth families are having a harder time raising entrepreneurs than low net worth families are. Oh, and as I said before, 75% of wealthy founders of businesses today grew up in that lower left-hand quadrant. So the term that my wife and I use for this is a strong business cannot hold a family together. But a strong family can hold a business together, whether you have a business or not. And even if you don't have a significant wealth, if you just have the desire of having your family stay together long term, you know, I, get a, I really understand a lot of this the best because of not my father's family that grew up in kind of an Ameri American wealthy Boston family. My mother's family, my mother's from a poor Cuban, uh, Cuban community in southern Cuba, and she was one of eight children. They had nothing growing up. But the interdependence it built of them doing what they did together and getting out of a communist country together, the interdependence that they built lasted until the day my mother died. If she had a problem, it was hard for me to get there in time to help her because my uncles and aunts were there before I could get there. And, and that was not present in my father's family. There was much more separation in different parts of the country and the like. Well, most parents want their children to keep going on that independent phase and be more successful than me and keep growing and thriving and this will be fantastic. And some do. But interesting, when parents focus on that, um, they're actually is a higher percentage of children that can grow up with a, a sense of guilt or embarrassment by the lifestyle that they ra were raised in. And to make it even a little bit worse than that, there was a study done by Madeline Levine, Dr. Madeline Levine, of wealthier families, and she found that wealthier families were two to five times more likely to have children that had anxiety issues. And often anxiety issues were based on loneliness as the key primary underlying factor. In other words, they didn't feel connected as much with uh, siblings and other family members. And children uh, in growing up in that middle dot are more likely to either never leave the dependent phase of life or to return to it more often by a long shot than children raised separate in, in different environments. So this is all culture related. How do you create a multi-generational culture? And what does it look like? And what's the role of philanthropy in the process of creating that multi-generational culture. It turns out they go hand in glove. And so how do you uh, incorporate all that? And there are articles about some of the levels of anxiety that we've been dealing with as a culture. But what we're trying to focus on with families is get, move families from that middle dot to the lower right-hand area to you know, keep being successful if you can. That's great. It's American dream. But can we be interdependent as well? It's the reintroducing interdependence. And even if you did a brilliant job and your kids are fantastic and they work together every day, then they get married. And spouses usually come in from the left-hand side of the equation. If you are at all wealthier of a family as a donor, whatever, if you are in a social economic level that's a little bit higher than your children's spouses, then you're reintroducing somebody else to a higher lifestyle, a different culture than they grew up with. And how do you do that? How do you onboard spouses into a family of success or affinity? If you, um, and, and what does that look like? And how do you onboard spouses into your values in your faith over time? Well, we refer to this as attaining what we refer to as a familyness culture and an ent entrepreneurial mindset, a family entrepreneurial mindset. Now, when I say family entrepreneurship, right away people think about building businesses and making money. I'm not talking about that. Family entrepreneurship is, uh, do we have a me methodology of identifying problems in the family and working together to solve problems in the family, relational problems in the family? That's entrepreneurial vision focused on family problems. Entrepreneurship in business is focusing on opportunities in the marketplace, identifying opportunities, capitalizing on it, figuring out ways to, to benefit from it. Um, social entrepreneurship is seeing problems, social entrepreneurship seeing problems in society and figuring out philanthropic ways or volunteering ways to solve this and create scale. Family entrepreneurship is more, more about the family, but that culture of a family actually creates more business entrepreneurs than the typical American culture. So it's really powerful to engage in what this would look like, and I'll build out what I hope this would look like to have a family in this culture and an entrepreneurial mindset within a family. Well, so the, uh, the, if they're going to be in the lower left-hand quadrant, they're going to be there by necessity. If we're going to get people to be willing to go over to that right-hand corner, they have to volunteer to be part of it. And this is where you can't go home and mandate the things we're talking about. These are things that ideally they would be encouraged into. 
And you're going to see that family philanthropy is a great way to encourage men to. There are others, and I'm going to share some of them with you as well. But, um, but it's, a, it's a wonderful one if you can get them in. And sometimes if you, some people feel like, well, this is all great, but I kind of missed the opportunity. My kids are now very independent. They're all over the world, and they don't really connect as much as I'd like them to. What do I do? And many of those families are focusing more on grandchildren. By the way, engaging grandchildren in some of this often has a positive effect back up to the children. Because if you do it with the grandchildren, those are cousins working together. When they go home and talk about how well they worked with their cousins, guess who wants to get to know each other a little bit better, typically? Their parents. And so it's a great way to encourage a kind of a backwards way, but encourage multi-generations to get involved in this. Well, the, the middle zone is the red zone. The left-hand one's the caution. Don't leave it until you're, you, know, you really understand what you... Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And ideally, as you get... Uh, to the right, or as, the, the real green zone is the, the middle. Independence is great, but interdependence is also great. And we want people to feel independent in their lives and have a sense of agency, but ideally they also feel an ability to work with each other in multiple ways. And the way we articulate this in a vision for a, a family that may have businesses or a wealthier and sometimes a higher social economic family is with railroad tracks going off out into the distance. And if you think of railroad tracks going off into the distance, they go out to a vanishing point on the horizon. So it looks like they come together. But there are three things going on in this picture that don't come together. And the, one of them is the right-hand rail which is us focusing on the business or the money, the estate plan, the trust, the family foundation, the donor advised fund, whatever it is, us focusing on money-related things that we want to really come up uh, with uh, decisions on. The left-hand rail, though, is the relationships of family. Who's focusing on that? What are, who's actually in the next generation taking over the responsibility of focusing on some of the relationships in the family? What does that look like? I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But then there are these cross ties and to me, the cross ties are the really important piece or the best place to really focus on because these are activities that we can engage in together that actually pull the whole thing together. And um, remember before I was saying the biggest reason that families were failing, according to families were failing, was due to lack of experience and trust around group decision-making. All of the things in the middle require group decision-making. And it's an opportunity to engage in, instead of you planning a family vacation and inviting the children, what if you gave them the budget and they planned the family vacation and invited you? They're making decisions together. Um, what, you know, how do you engage them in philanthropy decisions together? Where there's something they can do independently and something they can do together. And so these middle activities, we're going to spend some time talking about it. What would that look like? And I, just as an example of how important this is, one family meeting that we were running for a client, the mother said, when we were talking about roles for people in the family, the mother said, oh, I don't really have a role. They all have roles, or a lot of them have roles, but I don't really have a role. I just run the holiday party. I mean, I just organize the Secret Santa, and I come up with the meals and distribute the, you know, the, the different tasks for plated dishes to come, and people bring them in stuff. And I come up with a venue, and I come up with a team-building experience. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Everyone in this family talks about that holiday experience as one of the core traditions of the family. What's the succession for your role? Who are you raising up to be successors to take that over? And what are they doing for you? And she was all proud, but she recognized, I'm not raising anybody. So many families have an important role like that that they don't identify and celebrate and build succession for. And that's very often what next generations don't have that glue pulling the family together when the parent's gone. So what we normally see is that there's an intentional focus in most families that have gained any level of financial uh, success on the money and the businesses and things like that, the real estate. Usually they take family for granted. They just think everything's going fine. This Thanksgiving was great last year. We must be doing great. And then they do nothing in the middle. They just do their own independent thing, and uh, they don't really focus on some of those middle activities. The ones on the left build cherished relationships. The ones in the middle, it's an opportunity to participate in purposeful engagements. And on the right is the stewardship of the abundance, if the family has any abundance. And I, I said, I learned more from this about my, from my mother's family. Remember, she didn't have financial wealth, but she had family wealth. There was wealth in that family that my father's family didn't have. They had money. They didn't have family wealth. I hope that resonates because that was critical. <laughs> they, they were not focusing on it. For me, the right-hand part of that is that focusing on the stewardship 
and that's important for wealth but important for legacy, if you want to have a legacy in your family long-term for them, fourth cousins to know each other, it's really important to focus on the other two, more so than the money. And use some of the money to fund that, by the way, the things on the other side. And the roles that are available on the money side, we know what the roles are. But on the, on the relationship side, there, really, there are a lot of really great roles for people. Who's doing the team building? Who's building the culture? Who's focusing on communication? In the middle, there are also some great roles as well, like running the family meeting. Who's, who's on the agenda to run the family meeting? And who's organizing the family philanthropy? It shouldn't just be you. <laughs> family philanthropy requires a committee of a family making decisions together. And I'll talk about what we did in our family that we, didn't, we don't have the money. that I'm, Most of the families we work with have way more money than we have. <laughs> so we're benefiting, though, because we're doing the same things that we're encouraging them to do. We're just doing with much smaller dollars. <laughs> but they're having the same effect, and that's really the critical thing to me. So um, those middle activities, though, are the real opportunity. And you'll notice in that middle activity, family meetings, we find that family meetings are critical. If you're not having organized and prioritized family meetings at least once a year, typically twice a year, um, a family, we even found a family that survived into a fourth generation that's not having organized and prioritized family meetings every year. That is not Thanksgiving dinner and it is not a business meeting. It is not a meeting where you come in and talk about the business or money. Well, then what is it? It's where you actually get together and talk about the family and the values and, you know, what, and, learn, and celebrate each other. What are the roles? And, and I'll talk about what that can look like in, in a minute, but, but the family meetings and family philanthropy are the two of the most critical ones that we see. And if we find a fourth generation family still holding together and preserving the family, let alone their wealth, they are very, very likely, like 99% chance, they have family meetings and they actually engage in family philanthropy. Mother Teresa had a great quote for this. She said, I can do things you cannot, you can do things I cannot, together we can do great things. Are we building a culture of the family working together and, and encouraging it and focusing on it uh, ongoing? And that's really the key uh, of what we're advocating and you'll see as we, um, as we go forth killed my watch. Anyway, but it's all those activities that I just mentioned that are the opportunity for you to build trust, for the family to build trust with each other. And if every, some people, pa parents say, well, this sounds great, but we've got one child that just doesn't want to do it, so we can't do it because we can't leave one of our kids out. What we're finding is if you had five kids and one of them didn't want to do it, building a bond of the other four is more likely to bring the fifth one in than doing nothing. And if the fifth one never comes in, they're just a naysayer in the whole process, Building a bond to the other four is still a good thing to do because you at least have a group of people that will be able to come back together, some of the, maybe the, the influences along the way. So um, have, families just generally do this. All we're trying to add is a little bit of this to the equation, intentional this. And you're going to see that, that philanthropic role. And it's not just the philanthropy allows them to make decisions together. Giving to charitable causes, giving to people that in need, giving to causes in need that are actually is very therapeutic to a person that grew up in wealthier environments or a nicer lifestyle. It turns out to slow down, slow down something called hedonic adaptation. And it turns out that's a really good thing to slow down. And I'll recommend a book to that at the end. It's in the booklet. It's actually in the material that you'll see when we get to it. Well, I go back to 60% of the failures due to lack of trust and experience around group decision-making all those things that I just mentioned are the opportunity to make decisions because the greatest burden to bear in life is no burden to bear. And many times parents uh, raise children that don't feel like they have an obligation or, or role or responsibility to the family itself and to, to that greater good. Uh, there's a great uh, analogy for this. Do any of you remember how Clarence started the process of saving George Bailey? He what? Yeah he, well, he, yeah, he jumped in. He jumped in the river in front of George Bailey and turned around and said, help. And instantly he gave George Bailey another purpose in life. And the rest of the movie is him showing George that he had an incredible purpose in his life. And many times, you know, uh, families uh, are missing that opportunity to give people, to ask for help from family members. We need your help and getting them engaged, and, have, and, then get, get, and then having a purpose. 
you know, it's, it's not so much the pursuit of happiness. It's the happiness of pursuit. Having something to engage my life in gives me greater happiness than just trying to make myself happy. So, you know, Clarence started that process of saving George by jumping in and asking for help. And it was a great remembrance then of the purpose of his life. Well, um, I'm not trying to say then that you need to be, you know, engaged at the hip. I'm, and because some people say so far this is sounding like it might be too stifling. We have to force our family members to work together. Uh, this idea of total separation, two rings that are not connected is not healthy. That's the total independence, the point of not knowing each other. But I'm not advocating that we have this incredible overlap where we have to be like, you know, minions and automatons just fo focusing on everything. And that's stifling uniformity. And people are going to want out from that. But where's the overlap? Can we look for just a little bit of overlap? And that really is the key. Having an overlap requires some definition around it. We're finding that family philanthropy often has an overarching vision or goal, but allows some flexibility so people can look for where the overlaps are, where they connect with the overlapping vision, but they also connect with something in their lives as well. And what would that look like? Well, our whole purpose at GenLeg is to help families stop going to the upper left, start moving to the lower right, and we created a seven-step process to help families start to move in that direction. And the, the seven-step process comes from the research we did of families that have succeeded to a fourth or fifth generation of preserving the sense of unity as a family. And those are the ones that we said before have family meetings and usually engage in family philanthropy as well. And, uh, but you'll see what the seven steps are and they are designed to help a family get to that familyness culture and the, um, and the entrepreneurial mentality. Oops, I have a repeat. My apologize. So the how, how do you do it? The seven-step process, we think you need to start with the foundation, so our seven-step list starts at the bottom and works up, actually. We take an assessment of where the family is today, and I'll show you what the assessment looks like in a minute. Um, then we think there's some level of education that needs to happen in the family. They need to see some of the information you've just seen about why are families failing and hopefully get inspired to some of the things that they can engage in so that they want to voluntarily be part of it. Uh, this leads to then, do we know how to communicate with each other? Uh, one of the biggest issues is families don't learn how to make consequential decisions together because they don't learn how can I style shift to work better with you. If I've tried communicating with you five times in the past and it didn't work, trying a sixth time, but speaking louder is not a good strategy. <laughs> um, I have to have a different method. Well, how, that means I need to know something about how you communicate and want to be communicated with. That requires a little bit of grace, a little bit of forgiveness and empathy. So uh, we, we actually test people on their communication style. This leads to a values exercise. Notice we don't think you start with values. We think you want to be able to talk about values when you know how to communicate with each other. Uh, many times, if, there are, if you can't communicate with each other, it's going to hard, be hard to talk about almost anything. So um, we bring values as step four. Then the culture of the family. Can we really build the culture we want together as a group that think, think, focuses on our long-term vision? Then what actions can we take based on our values? This is where family philanthropy is usually one of the first things they engage in. And that all leads to, now how does all this work we just did fit the estate plan? Now can we go back to our estate planner? Can we go back to our wealth manager and design a plan and a strategy for our wealth that actually is designed to fit the vision we have as a group that we'd like the family to attain 40, 50, 100 years from now? That's very different than we normally see. Normally we see a tax-minimizing money plan that just gets more money to people who don't know how to work together. So that's the seven steps of the, um, of the process. We've run family meetings now for over 300 families and surveyed an additional 200. And the things we've seen, number one, we haven't found one that's gotten into a fourth generation that doesn't have family meetings. Uh, in place, organize, and prioritize. And that's not just something you should run forever, but um, certainly within 10 years of you stepping out of the role, you should have been bringing people in to be running the family meeting so that you get to, by the time you're you know, in your final years, you ought to be a participant in the family meeting, not driving the agenda at all. Well, what would that look like then? Um, most clients are now utilizing similar agendas to the ones that we're advocating, and I'll show you an agenda in a minute. 
Uh, we've compiled the most foundational themes, and that's how we came up with the seven-step process, what we were seeing in those families that were succeeding uh, over time. And then family meetings are, 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 are an easy tradition for the next generation to keep going with if they've been engaged in running them. It's a very difficult tradition for them to invent the day the parents are gone. Thus why we recommend engaging in the process now. Um, and what we bring to the table normally is objectivity that parents can't bring to the table, experience and wisdom that they might not otherwise be bringing to the table as well. So to succeed, you must be having family meetings, Hire a facilitator, oftentimes, it, doesn't have to be, it could be any number of people out there that can do this kind of stuff. Select a special place, because the place builds memories. Uh, do team building and trust building activities when you're together. It could be a camping trip, it doesn't have to be that grand. Um, create multiple opportunities for consequential group decision making. Have recognized roles for everyone in the family. Practice, 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 and in, then endow the process as part of your estate plan. That's really critical. Um, tradition, families that have done this well, the well-known names you know, you've heard of some families uh, that have done this well, but of the 200 families we surveyed, most of the names you wouldn't recognize. But they're doing almost the same things you'd see in some of these families. That the, the Coors family has family meetings every year. They have committees that come and report on all kinds of things, not about the money. It's about activities in the family. Philanthropy is a powerful role. If family philanthropy is a powerful role in every one of these families and almost all of the 200 families that we surveyed that have survived multi-generationally. So um, it's a really great opportunity. All legacy families have family meetings, and all the ones we've surveyed have family philanthropy as part of it. The kind of things you address at a family meeting when you have them is a whole list, like the culture of the family. Can we talk about it? Can we think about it? If we were to try and strive for a better or different culture, what would that look like? How do we start engaging together to make that? Family vacation planning and philanthropy are some of the first things that they often engage in. Family history and education, great committees to have on a family, uh, family meeting process. What's our education model or module for this year? Uh, family history or holiday traditions and succession planning, team building. Um, then we can talk a little bit about the business, but it should be a really short portion of the family meeting, 10, 15 minutes, just an update, and then move on. That's not the point of the family meeting. That's the family business meeting. That's separate. And then governance of all these. How are we going to make these decisions going forward? Because that is group decision making. One of the business owners we were working with recently said this. He said, I built my fortune, my family fortune in capitalism, but now my grandchild wants to be a socialist. What happened? What do I do about it? Um, the same can be true of faith. We have a lot of families of faith that say we're really disturbed that we have children or grandchildren that are just growing up in the culture of America, not the culture of, of our faith. And it's not the kind of thing we're finding you can typically transfer by lectures or sermons at home. But these activities we're talking about where you're engaging together is a fantastic way to transfer these values. I mean, Habitat for Humanity started out as a faith-based organization, and, um, but they're, and they still are at the core, but they're engaging families working together as, a, as parents with their children and grandchildren, building a house with the participants that are going to be a part of the house down the road. That's an example of a charitable organization where parents get to witness what they believe, not talk about it. You should speak what you believe every day and sometimes use words. And that's really the big opportunity in those middle activities. So if you think about that picture I showed you before, those middle activities, and I'll just pull up the, the concluding one here, the, um, those middle activities, family meetings, family philanthropy, family vacation planning, family entrepreneurship, lifestyle choices, do we teach the family a healthy lifestyle? Because it's not the one you see advertised every day by the magazines and by... Um, so family history, are we archiving it? But even if, you're, even if you're head of the train, as Will Rogers famously said on those railroad tracks, you'll get run over if you just sit there. So how do you stay ahead? And this leads to the last part of what I want to focus on, which is how do you start to learn better who are these people? Who, I, we refer to it many times we do seminars called who are these strangers we call family? How do we get to know these people to a deeper level? The assessment that we actually start off with and we educate the family about their assessment um, is just... 
a set of, this is a picture of the assessment that we use, and I blanked it out because it's kind of proprietary, but it's an example. It's a series of statements, and one of the statements might be this one. We have identified the best role for each of our family members that leverage their unique talents and gifts. I know their strengths, and they know mine. Everybody in the family gets this list, and everybody in the family on one side of the page grades, how important would that quote be for us to accomplish as a family? And they might rate it as a five, really important. And on the other side of the page, they grade, and how well are we doing at it right now? And that's one that they often rate at a zero or a one or something like that, that they don't feel like they have an actual engaging role in the family. And, uh, and that I don't know the roles and opportunities of other family members. And that would be what we call a five-point gap. And if the mother had that and the father had a four-point gap and one of the kids had another four-point gap, we're up to, we're up to uh, what, 13. And we would add those all up, and then we tabulate them to show the family, here was your number one. This family had, our family has concrete next steps to address the, um, the elements needed to sustain our family wealth and unity. And that was a 31-point gap for that family. And the next one is a 30-point gap, and the next two are a 29-point gap. But we would just, prior, and what ends up happening is the family itself sets the agenda of what they want to do differently. It's not us telling them. It's not you telling them. It's the family itself starting to come together around what they'd like the vision of the family to look like. On the communication front, there are a lot of tools out there, but we use one that we think is really helpful. It has the highest rating for changing group dynamic or changing culture of a group or organization, and that's what we're all about. So um, that's why it's critical to us. But um, the importance of communication was probably best described by George Bernard Shaw he said, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We tend to think we've communicated really well with our family. And you know, universally across the board, everyone knows the exact same information, and they all feel that they know the exact same information. That's rare. Usually family members feel like, oh, they told them this, they told them this. I didn't hear the full picture. I don't know the whole picture. And uh, so this is a real challenge. There are four ways that communication could go wrong. I mean, there's what I want to say. I know what I want to say. There's what I actually say. Might be a little bit different. There's what you heard me say. Could be very different. And then there's what you think I meant by it. And then there's my body language. Did I sound snarky or impatient or frustrated? And we think we're getting our point across. What are we, delusional? And so this whole can we talk, we think one of the first things we need to do is help the family understand how they communicate. Well, the tool we use had two different axes they were looking at. What's the power axis? When you speak up, how do you like to speak up? Do you like to come in challenging and engaging and with authority? And, you know, there's some people that really like to, or just, it doesn't have to be with authority. It could be a coach. A coach can be real positive. It doesn't have to be negative. A coach can be like, come on, you can do it. I believe in you. I know you can do it. You did it. In That's encouraging, but it's challenging. And so people, some people are very challenged, and they want to challenge you in, in when they speak. I'm that way. You're getting a point of it. Um, some people are much more supportive in how they communicate, and they want to really ask questions and engage you and find out where you are and help support where you are before they move you on, and very supportive in how they, mentoring is like this. And some people think, oh yeah, I get it. So the challenging people, that, those are the leaders, and these are the followers. Interestingly, these are not leaders and followers. This is leaders and leaders, but they're different. When we do family meetings, we often ask, can you give examples of challenging people? And they'll say, Donald Trump, and they'll say, you know, a bunch of people that they'll typically list, but he's very typically number one nowadays. But anyway, so they would list all these challenging people. Um, and then we say, can you list some people that have changed the world that are on the other side of the coin? And they would list Mother Teresa, Jesus Christ, Buddha, you know, Muhammad. I mean, they would list a whole bunch of different people. Many times they will list somebody faith-based, depending on their faith. But um, even without their faith, they'll often list faith-based leaders. <laughs> Interestingly, though, and, and, and again, it goes back to that leaders and followers. The people I just mentioned are not followers. They changed the world. They just did it differently. And so how do we mentor family members? And it's interesting for family members to see that it's not just the people that speak in an engaging, challenging way that are actual leaders of the family, especially for the people focusing on relationships in the family. They are much more likely to be on the mentor side. 
Then there's the activity axis, which is, you know, what action do you take? Now that you've all jazzed up and you're motivated, what action do you take? Some people are very spontaneous, and they're creative, and they're expressive, and they're, they're kind of out-of-the-box thinkers. And some people are much more disciplined, and they're organized, and they're orderly, and they're rigid, and they're kind of task-oriented. So we've got challenging people, task-oriented people, supportive people over here, and, and people-oriented people up here. And they named these different quadrants. The upper left-hand corner were the persuader styles. Upper right were the counselor styles, very supportive and creative and, and engaging with people. Um, lower, lower right is the analyzer style, very fact-based, disciplined, very organized, very task-oriented, want to get the task done right. And then the director style, they want to get it done. I mean, they're really about efficiency and getting it done quickly as well. They don't want to just get it done. They want to, they want to get it done right, but they want to get it done in a timely fashion, very results-oriented. And we would then create a grid of the family members. And each one of these is a couple. So uh, over here, we have Bobby and Mary. They're on the challenging side. You walk in their house, and you hear it. You see it. You feel it. They're, they've got a culture that's engaging because that's how they live their lives. And Fred and Betty over here in the green, they're very supportive. They're very mentoring-oriented. They're wonderful. You go in their house, and again, you feel it. It's quiet. It's organized. They're caring. And it's, it, nothing's wrong with either one of these. But you're going to try and get them together and make a decision, with, having not made a lot of decisions over the past, and it's going to go well, you think? Um, wouldn't it make sense if they practiced making decisions, they learned how? And what we normally find is the people on the left-hand side um, can kind of push through decisions pretty quickly and not take the time to listen to people on the other side as much as they could have and would have, and they can leave people feeling disenfranchised as they walk out of the room. These differences can separate a family. These differences often do separate a family. And these differences are what a family needs to learn about so they can start figuring out how not only can I not separate myself from you, but how can I learn to use your strength because your strength is different than mine. I can do great things, you cannot. You can do great things, I cannot. Together we can do great things. And um, uh, the Green family of Hobby Lobby fame, when we met with them, we didn't work with them. They're, again, one of the families we interviewed. But one of the grandchildren married a guy, and he had this great quote. They have family meetings every month to focus on the family, not the money, the family. And they had a wonderful um, grandson-in-law that said, yeah, this family gets it. They recognize we need to spend time building the bridge of grace and trust so we can drive the truck of truth over it. And that's really what we're advocating to get family members engaged in. Can we figure out a way of acting with grace and trust? And in that environment, we can build the trust that, remember, was the key of missing it. Because a friend of mine, Jamie Bush of the Bush family down here, he had a great quote. He said, uh, it's, it's also attributed to Nelson Mandela, but Jamie Bush said it as well. But unforgiveness is like eating rat poison than waiting for the rat to die. And in families, this often looks like somebody has a grudge against another family member, and they just harbor it, but they don't do anything. And it only hurts the person that's harboring it. It's not hurting the person that's not harboring it. Well, it is in that they're not working together, but other than that. Family philanthropy creates all kinds of opportunities to think about governance, to think about what are our expectations, what's the budget, what's going to be the skin in the game for participants? Should we just let them give away mom and dad's money, or should they engage in it? Uh, partnerships. There's so many things that a family can do that can create wonderful opportunities for decision-making and governance. And then to think about the broad categories that we can be giving to, and human need, education. Uh, when it comes to faith-based philanthropy, we often find that the overarching umbrella can be the faith, but in reality, it needs to have some flexibility. So there may be somebody that doesn't believe in the authority figure that uh, is articulating the, the faith, but they might believe in some of the principles coming out of it. Like they might believe, you know, maybe I don't feel that God intended for us to be dominion, have dominion over the world, but I do think we do have dominion over the world. I want to take care of it. So maybe they want to give to to causes that take care of the environment for different reasons, but they can engage with the family in giving to causes that they think are most impactful at changing the environment. So th there's a, an example of maybe something might have an overall arching, overarching faith component that the parents believe in, but has some flexibility for family members to still feel like they can engage. There are many ways, but just as an example 
uh, we've seen. Ultimately, all of this process of working together leads to, ideally, you sitting down with your advisors and coming up with an estate plan that puts it all in place. And um, David York, who I mentioned before, had a very simple diagram to articulate what this could look like. Almost never does, but could. He said that the family purpose, this is not your purpose. This is the family agreed upon shared purpose. That requires a family meeting to even discuss. What is that? But the family purpose should drive the planning process. And the planning process should support the family purpose. And if you set that up, then the money in the business goes along for the ride. It's, it's a very simple little picture. The problem with it is I've almost never seen it exist in reality. What usually happens is the money and the tax minimization strategies and the concerns about entitlement and the control issues of the parent and, and all these things and the fears that the parents have drive the planning process and the planning process supports the protection of the money and the protection of the, 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 you know, the, the asset classes and things like that. And the family purpose is often in left field that nobody's ever taken the time to really talk about the family as a whole. What is the purpose of our family? And if we have wealth, what is the purpose of the wealth we have as a family? And um, so while the, 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 the shared family purpose is over here, it's often not included in the plan over there. Well, we often create, and this is something that we can offer for you as well, free as part of this engagement. If you want, we can um, do a, a call if you line it up through the, the Dallas Catholic Foundation. Um, but we can do a call with you for 45 minutes and create what my wife and I created. We call it a family and financial blueprint. It's obviously a blueprint of the family because it'll have dad and mom maybe and it'll list the children and the grandchildren and what kind of charities you give to now and things like that. But it'll then layer on it the various tools you could put in place. Um, and it's complicated. I know it looks complicated. Believe it or not, we've had very wealthy families say, but this is so much simpler than the typical diagram I see from an, an estate planning attorney. Um, and and I'll, so I'll show you what one looks like. In fact, this is what one might look like when we fill it out. Well, when we, we would fill it out in front of people. And we'll do this in the phone if you want. Um, but this is a freebie. Here's one that an estate planning attorney did. This is a well-known estate planning attorney. I'm an estate planner by background. I don't understand what this chart's showing. I mean, we've got Kathy up here and... Maria here, but Maria, Frank's over here, and, but Frank's here, and Frank's there, and Frank, where's Frank? I mean, he's all over the place. There's only one Frank. And you often see that. It's like different things that go to, it's, it's a flow chart of money. It's not a flow chart of the family. The way we normally would fill it out, we would list the parents. This is actually my wife. This is a client one, actually, but we changed the names to my own family. And then they've got a couple of kids. We talk about what they're doing in the philanthropic area and how they're using a donor-advised fund, in this case, of giving. But notice there's a green box down in the lower left as part of the philanthropic pool. That's what they're letting the next generation engage in from the same donor-advised fund. And, uh, but what's the skin in the game that they have to have in it? What do they have to do to get part of that giving opportunity? And what does it look like? Um, and then some of the trust that they might have in place. Multi-generational, that's why it's color-coded. And the, the boxes that have three colors in them go to the first generation, then the second generation, then the third generation. It's a multi, so it's color-coded. Try and make it simpler. Um, the charitable remainder trust concept, a brilliant concept. Most families should have one. Most don't, but great idea for funding long-term philanthropy and, and helping your lifestyle in the meantime. Um, we also recommended uh, setting up a trust designed to endow your family meeting process. That's why it's in green. The green boxes are legacy boxes. These are things that encourage the, the family to work together multi-generationally. Estate plans don't typically include these, but a, a trust designed to endow the family meeting process is really good. And then uh, a family bank, a pool of money to encourage entrepreneurship in families. What would that look like? These green boxes are rarely in a family estate plan, and yet they usually align with the family long-term vision of what they'd like the family to look like 100 years from now. Why don't they be part of the estate plan? This particular family had a lot of money. So they had you know, 50 something million in his name and 11 in her name, so they were a wealthy family. But again, you could do this with almost nothing. And the point is, whatever you have. I was doing a family meeting one time, and one of the daughters, when I was talking about setting up a family compound to encourage the family gathering together and what that could look like, and the family um, said, we're not sure we have enough money for this. And the daughter-in-law, uh, who came from nothing, said, my family does it. 
And it's like, everyone looked at her like, how on earth are you funding what he just talked about? And she said, well, my grandparents had this farm in the middle of like Biloxi or some strange place. And um, it's, it doesn't have any financial value, but we rent it out to a farmer. But we also go camping on the family farm every year. We all get together because we want to tell stories. She's doing exactly what I'm talking about, but they're doing it with almost no money. They're setting up tents, and they're doing it. Now, you don't have to set up a tent if you don't want to. But, um, but there, there are methods to doing this that are really cool. You don't have to have huge money to be endowing some of these things. Um, that we would typically show. If you'd like one of these, we call it a financial blueprint, family and financial blueprint. Again, this is what we could do on the phone with you. Just line it up through the Dallas Catholic Foundation, and we'll, they, they've got some dates they're going to kind of try and come up with, I think. But the pieces of the puzzle that are not typically in a traditional estate plan are the green boxes. And if we were just pull those aside, I slightly color-coded them a little bit differently, but those are the ones we find really uh, differentiating. Because ideally... The family, um, when it comes to thinking about legacy, would really learn as a group what a legacy lifestyle is. A legacy lifestyle, you know, some people think, well, we're going to have a, we like skiing, so we're going to have a ski house, or we like water skiing, we're going to have a lake house. And these are great things for one generation, maybe one generation and a half. They're not a legacy property. Because three generations from now, there are too many people that share it together at the same time. So what ends up happening, it becomes a dividing property. Now, you get it in July, you get it in August, and I get it in September. Now, I will see you less during those months because we have our own separate time. And that, that's what they normally do from a governing standpoint on a family property like that. Well, what would it look like if you scrapped the lake house and had a legacy property? It's very different, and it's not expensive, and, um, and it transformed long-term families. So what would that look like? And going from... Um, if, if a, a mentality of inheritors to a mentality of stewardship. These are biblical principles, by the way. To, most of what my wife and I do are bib, biblically principle based. So um, I can't normally say that to a crowd, but anyway, I think I can say it here. Um, because, I mean, th there's so much wisdom in the Bible about family. It's a generational we worship a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a relational God we worship. I mean, there's, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, hope I'm not speaking out of school there. There's a lot of overlap between what I learned there and how you apply this within families as well. Well, these legacy, this legacy lifestyle that hopefully a family creates allows them to think as a family about legacy assets. What can we have that are legacy assets? Those green boxes I showed you in the last diagram. And this all leads to then um, uh, legacy structures, which are the... It, you could set up a structure to hold the assets um, down the road. Well, what we're finding is entrepreneurship, people think, is just about building businesses. In reality, entrepreneurship includes teamwork, philanthropy, education. All those are embedded in entrepreneurship. And a family entrepreneurial culture it has roles for everybody. Because if a family has a family entrepreneurial culture, there are roles for people in the relationship area. There are roles for people in the activities together where we're doing productive things together. Archiving our family history is productive. Um, and there are roles for us on the business side that we're doing together as well. There's an African proverb that pulls together a lot of what I've been sharing with you. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. And a lot of the business owners, that business entrepreneurs that I've worked with historically think that they know what I mean when I say that. If you want to go fast, go alone because that's what they often feel that they're doing with their business, that they're kind of like driving it, going alone. Um, but if you want to go far, go together. And that's exactly what we're focusing on. Uh, we do think that family meetings, um, typically, I've, I've given you a list of some of the agenda items we typically would see at a family meeting for a first family meeting, maybe a second, a third. Uh, I know that whoever you hire, if you ever, ever want to get started in the process, whoever you hire should be working their way out of a job that's how we describe it. We say, we got to work our way out of a job. If we're still running your 12th family meeting, somebody didn't understand the idea of family in family governance. Um, you guys should be running the, the fourth family meeting or fifth family meeting, um, but that doesn't mean that most families are ready to get started by themselves. If you are, great, go to it. But if you do want somebody uh, to help get started, uh, let us know, or there are others we can recommend that uh, are really good, or your advisors may know people that can help you. But we do think that you trying to start yourself a new family meeting process um, can go badly. So I really recommend you think about it long and hard before you jump into it. 
Uh, you already have a role in the family, uh, at least perception, uh, a perceived role, and you want to make sure that uh, people, uh, you know, that you can get beyond that. Anyway, there's a Chinese proverb that uh, kind of articulates some of this as well. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is right now. And there are ways you can get started in a lot of this. We think the way that you can learn more about it is if you're interested to, to engage in the, that phone call I mentioned before, because we'd love to share with you how some of this can come together uh, over time. We do have a series of books we recommend. The David Brooks, Brooks book, I really like. I know he's focusing on the problems of our society, but if you read it with a mindset of the family itself, you'll get the same point. He says, as a society, we're becoming very separate, independent at the point of estrangement. He doesn't use that exact term, that's ours, but still, he does say there's too much separation. We've lost the sense of civics. We've lost the sense of working together. Well, if you apply to what he's saying to the family unit, it's exactly the same. And um, I, I just am a believer that a society is built on the nuclear units that make up that society. The nuclear units are the families. So he's trying to solve it from a global perspective. We're trying to solve it from the family perspective. <laughs> if we can start to build stronger families, we think we can start to build a stronger society. And so, uh, but I think it's still a really good book to give you a sense of the times. I mentioned to you Dr. Madeline Levine. She wrote this book called The Price of Privilege, and she works with um, children that are presenting problems, mostly from higher net worth families. And, uh, and she just talks about these are families of privilege, and yet their children are two to five times more likely to have the presenting problems you read about in the paper every day. Alcoholism, substance abuse, mental health issues even, uh, anxiety, depression. This is much higher likelihood to be in, in place in higher net worth families. And her premise and my premise is it, the underlying cause in almost all of this is a sense of loneliness, not feeling like I am seen, I am known, I have a role, I have a purpose. The first place to be seen, known, have a role and have a purpose is the family. And yet many times parents give the sense that some of you in the family, not many of you, but some of you are really important, but most of you are not very important at all. Now, no parent would say that to their children. How do they give them this impression? The, the people that they talk to a lot and the, the roles they talk about are the people that are involved in the family business. Well, who's taking over the management of the family fund? Uh, you know, or maybe the foundation or whatever. It, it, they talk about these roles and they don't even identify these other roles that might actually be holding the family together every day. And that's really the difference. The, the Green family of Hobby Lobby fame, when they have their family meeting every month, they celebrate the people that had a birthday that month. And I don't mean they just had a birthday party. They talk about what are the things you succeeded in this year that you're most proud of. Can you tell us what they are? What, what did you, where did you fail that you learned lessons? What are the lessons you learned? We'd all like to learn from them. Most famous avoid failure. That doesn't mean they're not having it. They just don't talk about it. And yet those are the best lessons most of us have learned in our lifetime. And these families that are engaging and pulling it together are finding, by the way, that they have less of what Madeline Levine was talking about in her book. They have more connectedness, lower issues along the way. The Myth of Happiness by Sonia, I can't pronounce her last name. Um, I love the book, though. She talks about something called hedonic adaptation. If children are raised in a higher lifestyle, um, in fact, if they just experience a higher lifestyle five years into their, their age, um, they quickly adapt the new lifestyle as if it's normal. There's nothing normal about the lifestyle that most people that I work with have. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing normal about it. It's a blessing. But the children are often raised to think it's normal. And there's nothing wrong with it, but if you want to have a higher lifestyle, how are you training your children that it's a blessing? What does that actually look like? Family philanthropy, one of the key things you can, that it, it benefits is it slows down this hedonic adaptation. If you take your children or grandchildren on a, um, a, a project to build a house for Habitat for Humanity in, with somebody in Guatemala, and you're building it, you know, your children and grandchildren are seeing that, oh, wow, people are going to live in this? And all of a sudden, the home that they are actually living in starts to look like a blessing. It's, it's not normal. It's an incredible blessing. And we're all blessed, and, and that's not often focused on. This is a great book. 
to give a sense of that notion of slowing down hedonic adaptation, and it's all about the family meeting process and engaging. The Anatomy of Peace is um, a wonderful book on learning how to deal with, not avoid, but deal with conflict in, uh, in any group, but it's one of the top books in the area. Um, I think there's some other lessons you can learn that are even better than this one, but it's a good book that pulls it all together. Uh, some of the FBI negotiating techniques are brilliant when it comes to family. And it may be a better way of applying some of this than others. Um, uh, Bruce Feiler, he's written a number of books, but uh, this one, The Secret of, Fam of Happy Families, he tried to pull together a number of these themes. He doesn't give you practical steps of what to do next about it, um, depending on where you are, but it's a fascinating book that really does focus on the big picture uh, down the road on all of these things. Well, I've covered um, a lot of ground. I have a longer book list. Um, I'd rather end a little bit early and have more time for Q&A than end a little bit late and have less. Uh, but I have a lot of additional information I can jump to if your question jumps to it. But I'd love to be thinking about some questions of whether maybe how would this apply to your family? How could you apply this in your family, whether now or focusing on grandchildren? And I also would love to hear how have you applied this to your family? Some of you may have some phenomenal successes already going on that I bet others would love to hear about. And that would be great. And, um, and then if you want to, you know, maybe engage in how, especially if, how you've engaged in family philanthropy. Oh, there was one thing I mentioned I was going to mention and then I forgot to mention, so maybe I will uh, use my allotted final few minutes here because my own family, um, we engaged in this family decision making and um, we break it down this, to, when we, we call it little train. Remember that train tracks? Little train is the reason I call this little train is when I would say to a parent that you need to engage your children in decision making, right away they start thinking about their major decisions of them driving the big train, like the family business. And they're like, no, 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 they're you know, wet behind the ears, I can't do that yet. And I would say, well, no, no, you're driving the big train, keep driving, you're doing a great job. Don't let anybody in, you're doing a great job. But while you're doing that, how do you encourage your children to build their own set of tracks, get their own turn been running so they can step in your train over time because they'll learn over here? And it separates it so they don't worry as much about having to lose control of the things that they don't want to lose control of. <laughs> so little train, though, is uh, things like just talking about what's our vision for the future. What's your vision, kids, grandkids, of what you'd like the family to look like 20 years from now? That's an interesting conversation. And it doesn't have to change your estate plan. You don't have to talk about money, but just it's really interesting to hear. And so, and how would that vision create a mission statement over time? And the Rothschild family was classic, and they failed miserably as a family very quickly, financially, and, but, well, they fell apart, and that's why they lost their wealth. But they were really independent to the point of not liking each other. Um, the, Van, the, the, the excuse me, that was the Vanderbilt family. The Rothschild family was the opposite, so if I, I, I got them backward. They actually held together as a family to this day in some branches really effectively and um, really uh, preserved their faith and their family and their values really, really effectively in most of their branches. But Nathan uh, Rothschild said this, it requires a great deal of boldness and a great deal of caution to make a great fortune. But when you've got it, it retires, requires 10 times as much wit to keep it. And that's where most families don't go into that space. They just assume that the estate planning trust that I have will somehow keep it. Well, it doesn't keep the family. It may keep the money. And... Um, and uh, the, the, the famous quote that I like from the Vanderbilt families, Willie Vanderbilt, uh, William K. Vanderbilt, one of the grandchilds of that family, said, it has left me with nothing to hope for, nothing definite to seek or strive for. Inherited wealth is a real handicap to happiness. But remember, happiness is not the, the goal. It's the pursuit that often creates the happiness. Do we have pursuits that they can engage in in the family? Uh, practicing decision-making. We think family philanthropy is a great place to start practicing philanthropy. Um, governance, higher consequence, maybe planning a vacation as a family has a little bit higher consequence to the family itself than family philanthropy because family philanthropy is not going to affect how you're going to, you know, you, the dinner you're going to have that night. But family vacation planning might affect the dinner you're going to have on the vacation. So, I mean, it has more of an effect on the... the so a, some people think of it as a little bit higher consequence. But my kids, when I shared this with my kids, um, they wanted to do these two together. They wanted to do the family philanthropy and the family governance. Now, what we were doing is we have four children. We were letting them give away $5,000 a year from our donor-advised fund. 
$1,000 each personal endorsement. You know, we love you, we love what you care about, so we give it where you want. But there was a little bit of a skin in the game in that. They had to come up with either some volunteer time or a little bit of money before we would add the, our portion to it. But it, they had some skin in the game. That's an important component. But the 5,000, they had to agree on it. The 5,000 is the important part. It's the part that most people don't have. Most people encourage the individual. They don't encourage the group. The together giving is what transformed them. Today, most of the giving they do is the, to the together gifts. And it's really cool. But they also wanted to fund a plan of vacation. And so what they wanted to plan was we adopted all four of our children, but our two daughters are from an orphanage in Moscow. And they wanted to go back to Moscow as the family vacation. And they wanted to donate a playground to the, to the orphanage as part of the family philanthropy. And so here's some pictures of my kids at the orphanage when we went back to christen the, uh, the, the playground. And here are some of the, the pieces when they, that they donated. And here's a picture of my daughters um, with the staff of the orphanage behind them here. And we did a little concert to the kids in the orphanage. My, both my sons know how to play the guitar. But we sang um, uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round. These kids never get people entertaining them. But the caregivers were just blown away by it. My kids were blown away by it, though. It has become a transformative event. And they planned it. We didn't ask them to go to Moscow. We gave them a budget. They planned it and invited us to go to Moscow. That's different. In fact, a couple of years ago, they, for Christmas, they wanted to plan the next family vacation, and we went down to Costa Rica for Christmas. And here's a picture of us on Christmas morning. We were taking surfing lessons on Christmas morning in Costa Rica. Um, they have learned how to give together and how to work together because of all of this stuff that I'm talking about. And we don't have huge gobs of money. This stuff you can do with less, if you have more, it's more important. And the New York Times liked that story so much. I actually wrote an article about our family on the front page of the business section years ago. Again, we can get a copy of that too if you'd like. But um, I would uh, just remind you, if you'd like to have a family and financial blueprint, um, we volunteer them to groups that we do these speaking events for, just to organize it through the, the Catholic Foundation. So with that, I'm going to put back up the Catholic Foundation logo. And what, what questions or thoughts or observations do you have about some of this? Any, any thoughts? Well, my first thought is, what a terrific presentation. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Without a doubt, I think you gave us a lot to think about. And most of us, as you point out, very quickly, want this to last beyond one generation, and you gave us so many things to think about. Um, my uh, meteor question is, so you've got a son who is really tied to his family, and he marries a girl who is even more tied to her family. How do you bring that together? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, rem what's really interesting about that point is, ver remember, Children in wealthier families often grow a little bit more apart than children in a lower net worth family. So when they marry into a lower net worth family, and I'm not saying that that's what's happened here, but often it does, just by demographics, there are more people that have lower net worth than if you've, if you've got financial resources. So just by demographics, there are more people over there. And so if they do marry into a lower net worth family, the odds are it's a tighter family. And the odds are that will be a real draw to that part of the family. And I'm um, not saying that money can help you compete here, but money can help you start. I mean, by letting them plan a family vacation, engage in it, what, whenever they do get together or you do get together as a family, having them engage in it can be really powerful. Uh, starting a family meeting process and getting their input and having your son's spouse feel like her voice was heard and, wanted, and that the family wanted to hear her voice helps her start to bond with your family as well as her family, not just continue the bonding of her family. So um, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great point. But ideally, what we're seeing is uh, some families have even incorporated, um, this is going to sound crazy, you'd still have your family meeting, do the things you're going to do as your little nuclear unit, OK, as your family. But sometimes they do a separate thing where they include some of the cousins from the other, these other in-law cousins to do some of the family philanthropy or something like that, on a smaller level. 
So I'm not trying to you know, get crazy here, but things like that can really start to get these family members feeling like, wow, these guys have a vision of our family knowing each other and helping each other in a broader sense. So it's a great question. I hope that helps a little bit. I, some, a question that wasn't asked, but I'll bring it up, because is when do you start? And what we find is um, it's almost never too early. It's almost never too late uh, you can, from an age standpoint. Um, because you can take a three-year-old to the zoo, and you can be walking them in, and you can say, I, I know we paid money to come in here, but you know, they actually, they, they need more money to help feed these animals and take care of these animals. If you see one you really like, maybe we can figure out a way to give them a little bit to help feed that animal, and then we can come back and visit every now and then. And they're starting to learn that the zoo is different than McDonald's. You wouldn't believe how many 15-year-olds in families of wealth think that the business model behind the zoo is exactly the same as the one behind McDonald's. It's different. And so they start to learn that what philanthropy is, that yes, there's a little bit of a gate charge, but guess what? They take donations too, and, and, and that could be powerful. So they're, they're not engaging in the decision-making process, but they're learning the vocabulary. So when they, they join the family meeting over time, or they go on the family vacation, they know that family members were engaged in it. You, that works from about 3 to 13. From 14 years old to about 24, that's when you, you can engage them in decision making. They can be making decisions that have consequence. They learn by the decisions and successes and failures, and you can celebrate them, and you can you know, train them up and all kinds of things. Ideally, they're making smaller decisions, but you can do a lot. They can be engaging in the family bank, borrowing money for a lawn mowing business. There are lots of things they can do. Um, from 23 to about 33 or 4, 35, that's when we're bringing people into the family. That's when they're getting their significant others, they're getting engaged, they're getting married, they're having children. How do we onboard these people so that they feel onboarded? They feel like they're part of the family so that they don't, we don't start recognizing, gee, their spouse is taking them away from us. We're intentionally trying to bring their spouses into us from even when they're just significant others. And, uh, and that all leads to then the 35 and up Normally, you don't try and get them together and have a kumbaya experience and toast marshmallows and hold hands because they're just like, come on, we're baked. This is a little silly. Um, but engaging in the grandchildren is a very good way of getting them involved because oftentimes they like the idea of you organizing something called cousin camp for all the cousins to get together and uh, spend some time and have fun. But when they do, they go home and they tell their parents, I really like my cousin. Could we? And all of a sudden, they might want to be on that every five year family vacation, but not just your nuclear branch, family vacation of everybody. And um, so this is where these things kind of, remember, families are doing this. All we're trying to do is add a little bit of this. And it's got to be intentional or it doesn't happen. So anyway, next question or thought? Oh, yeah. Um, so you had mentioned that a legacy property, something like a ski house or a beach house is not ideal. Right. What would you say is ideal? Yeah, there's actually a lot of research on this, some of which we did. What we find is it should be a property that's no less than 100. It's got to be further away than 100 miles from a major airport, but it can't be 200 miles away. Somewhere in that 100 miles to 200 miles, that's close enough that they can fly there and get there relatively quickly, um, but not so far that you know it's too, too difficult to travel to. It's far enough away, by the way, from a major airport that it's less likely to become a suburb. A 100-mile commute is still considered to be too much, and we think it's going to be for a while. We hope it's going to be for a while. So it's kind of ruralish environment. So don't, don't think glitz. This is typically, even some of the wealthiest families we work with, when they have ranches now, I mean, a lot of them, big ranches, and, um, but the first houses they put on, the, one of the families I'm thinking of, they put on uh, uh, trailers. They had single wides. And then they had a couple of double wides. They eventually built a few cabins, but they're cabins. They're log cabins. They're, and they're not gargantuan they're, because they're recognizing it doesn't take long before some branch of the family will be very different level of wealth than other branches of the family. And, uh, and it doesn't take long at all. There's a wonderful book called Pecking Order that talks about that, that family wealth, uh, they, they marry you know, well or they marry not so well financially or they, or they just make a mistake and they lose a lot or any number of things that can cause some branches to lose wealth. And so to keep it where everybody can always be invited and included, it's got to be on the lower scale. So things like that, you wouldn't expect. You think that, oh, the cores are going to have the most fancy, incredible, um, not necessarily. 
Some families don't want to have an individual property. They want to have a pool of money that will allow us to rent really cool properties all around the world. And we will do it next year in Costa Rica. And we'll do it the next year somewhere else. Uh, the Searle family, of, uh, the Searle pharmaceutical family, they do that. And I can speak to this, they let me share this. They're not a client we worked with, but they are uh, one of the ones we surveyed. But they have a pool of money that they dedicate, fund, funded by an endowment for this purpose, um, not a charitable endowment, a family endowment, and they use the money to rent whole hotels. And they'll go and they'll try different places. But, so every fam is a little bit different, but they largely subsidize it. And the way they make up the difference, they don't say you need to pay $1,000 each. Because for some of your kids, that might be like nothing. They would say, um, but it might be for some other kids too much. That's too much of our budget for vacation this year. <laughs> so they say, we just need a percentage of your income. And we'll do it on the honor system if you want. But we just pick a percentage of your gross income, really low, and you got to give that. If you make a lot of money, it's going to be expensive for you. But you're subsidizing other people in the family. <laughs> so anyway, the things like that are what we're seeing are some of the governing processes. But, when the, but ideally, there's a committee of family members that's running this family property. It's not you guys maintain, making sure that the ski boat has gas in it or the horses are fed. It's the family committee that's hiring the, the, the rancher to come in and feed the cattle and stuff like that. So, but there's another committee opportunity for a group decision making. You know, and I, I should have said one quick thing about family meetings. The, the most important tradition you can pass down, from my perspective, of any tradition bar none is a family meeting process. Because all the other traditions you're thinking about would get talked about at the family meeting. The, the holiday party, the vacation, the, the family history, go down the list, they're all there. They would be discussed at the family meeting. And you should not be running the family meeting 10 years into this. You should be a participant and maybe a volunteer on committees. And because you want them running it, because then it's easy for them to maintain it when you're gone. It's very hard for them to maintain it if you ran it until the day you died. Sorry, point over here, question. You answered his question. Oh, I answered it <laughs> accidentally somehow. Yes. And what do you do when they have different cultures? Like, for example, in Mexico, they don't have taxes. The people give money to the family, and here are different. So, when you deal with the two families with different cultures, it's a really good question. My own family has very different cultures. My mother's from Cuba. And she's, one of, she's a Catholic family from Cuba, one of eight children. Um, just, just they're all over each other. It's like my big fat Greek wedding. Very different culture, you know, and they're not Greek, but still, they just, they just talk over each other. But they work really well together. They know each other very, very deeply, um, and they care, and they spend a lot of time focusing on that. My father's family was in a typical American culture of, you know, men hugging? Huh? No, ever. Uh, they loved COVID, some of the family members, because it was a great way to, I now don't have to hug all these guys. Um, so, so those are very different cultures. But what you want to come up with in your family, ideally, would be representative of these. But I would say, generally, you'll, you'll see that the families that are succeeding have a similar culture to a Mexican culture, um, many other cultures that are kind of, that are very focused on bigger vision of family where they get together and it's just rip-roarious. I don't know if, them, if that's what your Mexican family <laughs> was doing, but, but that culture that we're seeing that the culture of the family that is succeeding multi-generationally has that longer-term, bigger picture. And a typical American family thinks much more about building independent children, and they're really prideful that my children are independent, they have their own jobs, they're succeeding, they're paying for themselves, and blah, blah, blah. They don't focus on this notion of them doing things together anywhere near as much in their pride of their children. That's what we're trying to add. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, uh, it does? OK. But yeah, there are some cultures that are just better at doing a lot of this stuff than others. Anything else? Yes. Do you have a suggestion for <clears throat> how to manage participation uh, if people begin to opt out? They say, hey, I don't see the value in this. I'm going to step aside, and so can you create incentives or other things that would steer people towards participating versus just being on the sidelines? Yeah, it's a really good point. The, you will, um, it will not all be, you know, that kumbaya experience where everybody participates all the time. Sometimes they're just busy. Um, sometimes they just don't want to do it, um, or they've got other priorities, and I get that. Uh, but 
like the Rothschild family, they have some family branches that left a while ago that um, just not doing it, not coming. You know, I don't care about, you know, I, I'm still mad that she pulled my hair or whatever. Um, and so they just left. But that doesn't mean the door's closed for the next generation. And, uh, and that, that inclusiveness, they have many branches that previous generations in some of the branches had left and gone to different countries different, and just, just been totally separate, but they're now coming back in. One of the Rothschilds was really insightful about this, and then I'll come back to try and answer that a little bit more specifically. But one of the Rothschilds, I was doing a family meeting one time, and a guy came up and said, boy, what you're talking about is really important in our family. We spend time, money, and effort every year on this. Turns out he's one of the Rothschilds, and he lets me share this. But he said, um, we, because we have this family meeting, and we started coming back together again, you know, because my family didn't, participate for a while, but now we're, I've gotten to know these people, and I'm starting a business with a couple of my fourth cousins. Right away, I'm trying to think, what the heck is a fourth cousin? How far back do you have to go before you go forward to get um, And I said, well, how, why did you start them? Because I knew, him, I knew them. Because I knew them, and we did things together working in the family, I knew what their abilities were. We had time to talk, and you know, Malcolm Gladwell said this about, um, I, in his book, Tipping Point, he said, it's not that important that you share values with people that you're making important decisions with. And right away, I thought, well, he's wrong. That's, of course, wrong. And I met him one time in Buffalo at a conference, and, um, and I asked him, I said, Malcolm, you said this thing, and I just don't agree with it. He said, well, think about it. Think about your best friends from high school and college, okay? And he said, think about back then when you met them. Did you become best friends with them back then because you knew you shared values with them? Is that why you became best friends with them? Or was it because you shared experiences with them? Wasn't it, bless you, wasn't it because they're in the same class you're in or the same team you're on or in the same fraternity, the same dorm? Wasn't it through the shared experiences you come to even know what their values were? And don't you have some friends that have different values than you do? And I thought, oh my goodness, that's a much better explanation of how I got my best friends. I mean, I got a friend that's a Yankees fan. <laughs> I'm from Boston, you know, you know what that means. But I die for them. So the, it's the experiential exercises that these families were focusing on and that the so what we're seeing in families where if a branch has left, if they provide the opportunity to come back in in various forms, um, they usually do. The other part of it that I would encourage you is make sure it's fun. A family meeting should not be like a business meeting. Um, and this is where if people are going home and saying, yeah, it was kind of boring, we kind of lame, we missed the final four because we had to do this, watch the final four as a family if it's going on <laughs> during it. But, um, but make it fun. And so this is where sometimes the family vacation will add on um, a, a half day or a day or a day and a half of the family vacation will become the family meeting. So you're having fun, and you can even do some fun team building exercise. We bring team building exercise when we do these things because we want fun engagements where they have a chance to experience what it's like working together. Um, but they should have fun. If they have fun and they still don't want to come, their kids might want to come. But abandoning it, allowing somebody that's a naysayer to hold the entire family hostage from doing it going forward is not a good thing to do. And, that, and that's what sometimes we see family members would do. Did I cover enough points to give you some thoughts? I don't know if that's helpful, but we can talk later if you've got specifics. Other questions? No? Um, do any of you have stories of ways you've tried engaging your children in philanthropy that have been effective? Or anything else along this lines that's been effective? Children or grandchildren? Yes. We did a fantastic job thing with the one one time that was a, so my um, kiddos are young, the, the oldest is a recent college graduate, but we had a family meeting one time that was mandated by a Boy Scout badge and the um, subject of the family meeting was whether or not we were going to get a dog. And so everyone was supposed to do research, and then we were going to go around and vote. In the meantime, my youngest, who was the one trying to get the, it was a Cub Scout achievement, actually, not a Boy Scout badge. He was the one who wanted a dog and had begged me for the dog forever. So as we go around, the five of us vote. There's a vote yes for, for the dog, who was the person who was presenting. And there was an abstain from his brother, who didn't want a dog, but didn't want to sell out his brother. Then there was a no from the sister, there was a no from dad, and then there was a no from me, at which point I said, all right, that settles it, we're getting a dog. <laughs> at which point my daughter had a fit, she's like, wait a second, there was one yes, there was one no, I mean, there was one yes, there was one abstain, there was three no's, how are we getting a family dog? 
Anyway, it's one of our favorite family stories now, and we do do family meetings once a year, and every single time that story is told, and <laughs> it's become much more colorful over the years um, than, than it actually was, but um, you have um, given me tons to, uh, to tons to think about this morning in a really um, interesting um, presentation, but our... Um, our experience with our very first family meeting is now um, family lore that um, that I don't think any of us will ever forget. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you. I, I would say, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I would say that 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 whole notion of, of just getting the family together and making a decision, you'll find all, it can be funny of, of how they come up with ways of, you know, and who gets a higher vote than other people, and if that's appropriate to say, and what would that look like? Um, but it is interesting how families are using some of these techniques really effectively. The, um, well, I first learned the whole notion of family philanthropy from a guy named Charlie Collier, who wrote a book on this for Harvard Business School years ago. And uh, he was one of the one, he's the guy that introduced me to Jay Hughes, but who was a guru and all this stuff. But Charlie and I, I had a family I was working with in New York City at the time, and the grandparents had a, a, an apartment overlooking Central Park. And it's beautiful. I mean, you looked out, when you got off the elevator into their living room, you looked out and you saw just water. And it's because the lake in Central Park is right outside there. So it's a very wealthy family and they're doing great. Um, but the grandparents were really concerned about the family kind of falling apart. And uh, so they organized Philanthropy Day. And what they did was it was the day after Thanksgiving and they invited all the grandchildren to come to their, their co-op or their apartment in New York. And, um, and they had, they said, hey guys, we really need your help. This is all grandkids. We really need your help. You know, Grandma and I, we have a little bit of money left over that we need to figure out which charities to give to, and there are these causes that really need it really effectively. So we've got a couple of people coming. They're going to just give us a really short presentation on what they do. And it was really short. I mean, because it was, uh, and they presented uh, three different charities came, willing to get, come because they're getting a lot of money separately from other donations <laughs> from this family later on. But, um, but they came because they really wanted to educate these kids and what they do, and they showed some slides. They did a little, just short little stuff, and they left. And then they said, well, that was really helpful. And, but before you guys decide, we want to go on some site visits. So you little kids are going to go with your grandmother down to the zoo in Central Park and check it out, because we think that's one we might want to. And then you middle-aged kids are going to go down to the local school. They've got a program they want to put together after school that we thought you might be interested in. But you older kids, we're going down to the homeless shelter together. And we want notice the age appropriateness of those different causes. And they all came back, and then they said, now here's the, uh, the money we have, um, what do you think? And, um, and they allocated the, the resources. It was really cool. But on the way out the door, the grandparents said to each one of the kids, that said, hey, you know what? We still have a little bit that we think we can pull aside. So we've got an envelope here. We want to be able to give to causes you care about. When you get home, would you write down the name of a charity in your local area that you'd like us to give another $500 to? And we're going to make sure they get a check for $500 in your name. And it was just like, connecting it personally, kind of like the, the together giving and the individual giving. And they all went home and they, you know, most of them ended up writing these little names back and they'd give it. But as you know from a donor advised fund, which they had for this purpose, the, the gift came in the name of the kid. So the kid got the thank you letter, not, not the grandparents. Um, anyway, it was really cool, but that's just an example of how a family introduced philanthropy to the grandchildren level, and they said it has totally transformed their family going forward. So um, the Catholic Foundation in Dallas, great organization. I really appreciate working with them all, um, and uh, the fact you're connected to them tangentially, you're in great, you know, that's great company. Um, if, we can, if we can help, I think the one problem with these presentations is I have to throw out a lot of theory and the odds are I shared too much. Um, and, I, and I didn't mean to intentionally. The way to learn this is not by learning all the theory and you trying to figure out how to go and cobble it together. If you want to have a 45 minute call, um, just let the Dallas Foundation know. We, we can set up some dates and we can just do a Zoom call and we can then just tell us a few things about yourself, what your issues are. Then we can make, give you application. Application is far easier to digest than theory. And um, there are a lot of ideas, but um, we've done this for a long time. The odds are we've run into a situation similar to what you're dealing with, and we might be able to give you just a different way of thinking about it. But hopefully you see the connection. I really want to make that connection of we often use our wealth if we've been financially successful in ways we don't realize can be separating families over time. We can use some of it in ways that can be very unifying over time. 
And that's what we're really trying to add to the mix. With that, I think we're on time to say thank you to Catholic Center. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to come up the wrong way. I'm going to come up the wrong way. Thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. Well, thank you, Tom. That was very inspiring. Um, you know, I've heard you speak before, but every time I hear you speak, I learn something, a lot of things, a lot of things. And you make it seem so easy and realistic and normal and and achievable. And that is, is a real great asset. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees at the Catholic Foundation, on behalf of the staff of the Catholic Foundation, and on behalf of Tom, thank you all so much for coming today. We really enjoyed having you here for the Enhanced Leadership Luncheon. Um, I hope the material in your book will be helpful to you. And please do remember to reach out to us if you'd like to set up a call with Tom. Uh, we'd be happy to facilitate that. And please remember, February 16th is Tom's birthday. So whoever at your table has February 16th in your, the closest to the pin, uh, please take those wonderful flowers home. We really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very, very much. Thank you.